What if I told you that you could design and live the life that you want on your own terms? Would you do it? Would you take a leap into the unknown? Or would you settle for a life of limits, a life of safety but lacking true meaning? Zeph and Moses Blacksburg here, and I'm on a journey to help you ignite your inner passions, let go of your fears, and get more out of life. Will you join me and make this year your year of purpose? Welcome to the Year of Purpose podcast. What's going on, Year of Purpose podcast? This is Zephan Blacksburg back again with another episode, and today I'm joined by Lou Mangello. And Lou is a widely recognized Walt Disney World author, expert, host, speaker, and entrepreneur. He is the host and producer of the WDW radio show, which has been named Best Travel Podcast for 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. (laughs) The author of the Walt Disney World trivia books, 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World, and the author narrator of audio tours of Walt Disney World. Lou is the founder of the Dream Team Project, which sends children with life-threatening illnesses to Disney World. He was a successful lawyer and owner of an IT consulting company back in New Jersey before leaving them behind to pursue his passion and share it with others. He is now an internationally recognized expert on Disney and is a featured speaker and consultant who shares with businesses, individuals, and groups the magic of Disney and or the power of new and social media, podcasting, entrepreneurship, and building your business and brand. He is also a youth motivational speaker who shares some Disney magic in schools by bringing Disney into the classroom with engaging, thought-provoking, and entertaining assembly programs designed to motivate and inspire students. Lou also enjoys helping others pursue their passion by using podcasting to build their brand and business. Lou, how are you today? Good, man. Thanks so much for having me. That is such a cool title to have. So you are basically the expert on all things Walt Disney World. Uh, I, you know, I don't like saying expert, but um, I was a, a total Disney nerd, still am growing up. So uh, it's nice to be able to turn something that you're passionate about into your, your business. Absolutely. So this is something that I think we should dive right into because I know that most people listening probably love Disney or if they haven't been there, they should go. Um, how do you go from, you know, being a lawyer and having, you know, your own IT company to <laughs> just saying, well, I really love Disney, so I'm just going to follow that because there's so many people listening in. Uh, one in particular I can think of said, you know, I really love doing this one thing, but I, I don't know how I can make that a full-time job. So where does that decision even come from? I would love to tell you that I sat down and wrote out a business plan and figured out all the numbers and, and did the five-year plan, but it did not happen like that at all. Um, sort of long version of a short, short version of a long story is, yeah, I was a lawyer and I had this IT consulting company and always being in the service business, I wanted to create a product and, and try and resell it just um, to see if I could do it. Uh, so the idea of a book came to be and, and all I really knew about was Disney. I've had this love of Disney since uh, I was three years old and we went to, to Walt Disney World, got on the family truckster from New Jersey and did it every year. So the challenge was, can I write a book and can I get it published? Um, I learned everything I could about the book publishing industry, signed a three book deal and created a little two page brochure website, which started to turn into articles, um, started a discussion forum way back in 2004, again, pre all social media stuff. I uh, saw podcasting coming down the pike in 2005, um, understood the, the power of the spoken word over anything that I could have written. Uh, and really, man, accidentally, um, this hobby started to turn into a business I got a phone call one day from some somebody who said, hey, I love your show. How much would it cost to sponsor it? And I was like, what? Like, wait, <laughs> you know, you want to, somebody wants to pay me to, to do what I love. And that sort of um, kickstarted an idea. And at one point, I, I took the, um, the huge leap of faith. And I know you can appreciate this where I, you know, left. I was the, the chief technology officer for a medical imaging company. I left the practice of law. I sold the house. I thought I was going to live in forever. Packed up the Honda Odyssey and drove to Florida um, and have really been talking about Walt Disney World full time since about 2007. So I have to ask you this. How often do you actually get to go to Disney World? <laughs> so I literally live like as the crow flies, like a mile from the parks, right? I can hear, I can see the fireworks. I can hear the train whistle. Um, but I'm not there every day. People think I'm just like walking around, riding rides and, and eating food all day in the parks. But 97% of my business takes place right here. So 
Um, it still is is new and fresh and exciting, especially for my kids. It's not like, oh, dad, Disney World again, really? So they haven't added a monorail stop at your house yet to take you there. <laughs> not yet, but that would be nice. <laughs> that would be really cool. So uh, your kids have obviously been there, I'm sure, a couple times at least and got, got their fair share of, uh, you know, experiencing all the different parks and the magic that is Disney. Um, one thing that you do now is you're teaching people the power of podcasting to build their brand and their business. Uh, do you think that this is something that everyone looking to quit their job should look into as far as, you know, growing uh, their passion and what they want to go after? So I won't say everyone because I don't think the medium is necessarily for everyone. Um, there's a lot to it. You know, you know, when you put yourself out there, when you put your voice out there or your face out there, not everybody is super comfortable in doing it. Um, that being said, I, I wave the podcasting flag very, very hard. I think it's an incredibly powerful medium. Um, I love what you do in sort of in terms of doing the audio and the video as well. You know, I think we all have the ability and and almost should become sort of little mini media companies um, and you know producing content this way. But I think the intimacy of the medium, the immediacy of the medium, the longevity of the medium, um, there, there's so much, you know, I can give you a hundred reasons why I think podcasting is so very powerful and I think going to continue to grow in the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah, it's really crazy because I saw it when it first came out and I thought, oh, this will never catch on. And I, I never actually listened to podcasts until Serial came out last year. And, um, you know, for me, I was just like, there, there's no way. I mean, it'll die out eventually. And now it just looks like it's making a huge comeback. Like last summer was when I first started looking into it. And it just looks like this is going to explode for the next, you know, foreseeable future. So I'm really excited to see where it goes. And for everybody listening in, uh, Lou and I are both going to be participating in a conference coming up in July called Podcast Movement uh, out in Fort Worth, Texas. So that should be pretty exciting. Uh, so... Let's get into how you become the, this, this author, this speaker, this entrepreneur on all things Disney because uh, we don't know everything from the start, you know, and, and we, we're always learning. This is, you know, a, a constant thing. We're, we're constantly adding more to our library and our minds. Um, where do you start when you don't know how or what to do? Well, I think you need to start with, you know, and people ask me this all the time, well, how do I figure out what my passion is, right? I'm, I'm one of the, and I know the, the word is, is somewhat overused, but I am a firm believer in you need to, especially if you're going to podcast, do something that you are truly passionate about. And the reason why is because A, you've got to make sure you can sustain it. B, you've got to make sure that it all of a sudden doesn't become, it doesn't start feeling like work all of a sudden, like, oh, I just left my job and all of a sudden I got a podcast. And three, and I, or C, most importantly, your audience can hear it. Right. They can tell they can hear through your through the inflection in your voice if you truly love what you do. Right. So if I started a cupcake podcast tomorrow, well, I mean, obviously, I'm a passionate about cupcakes. So that's a bad <laughs> example. If I started like, you know, a show, a, a, a podcast about something I wasn't passionate about, your audience can tell if it's not genuine. So I think those three things are sort of uh, sort of the core and then take that and then start not just podcasting, but I think you need to create content. This has sort of been my philosophy since day one. Create content in the way that people are most comfortable consuming it. Mm -hmm. So I do audio, I do video, I you know do blogs, I do live broadcasts, I have published books, audio tours, a print magazine. So however it is that you like to consume the content, I think it's a great way to figure out what your audience likes and create it for them in, in a variety of different mediums. I think that's really smart. And you you brought out quite a few things there. So there's there's books, there's there's audio, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, I, and I think that you should be everywhere at one time when you start a business as, as best of your abilities. But uh, we often talk about the big successes, right? So everyone sees, oh my gosh, he's a speaker, he's an author, he's done all these things. We rarely talk about the struggles or the obstacles to get there. It kind of always seems like, well, he just kind of woke up the next morning and, you know, <laughs> he had a book and he had this deal and that deal and, you know, he just goes to Disney all the time, right? So how do we, uh, let's maybe go into, you know, what was one of your biggest obstacles, maybe just when you were first starting uh, to get this stuff off the ground? Because I know that uh, in all transparency, it makes sense to show our listeners and, and to tell them uh, this was not something that happened overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, and, and this is a process to get to where you are. 
Yeah, and and to that point, I I'm very very transparent, um, especially with my audience. You know, they know me the same way your audience knows you. They feel like you're their friend. I, I'm very transparent, open about uh, a lot of things. And I sort of use the tree analogy, right? People go outside and they see these big, beautiful trees with all these leaves. And, they, you know, what they don't realize is they don't look underground. They don't look in the dirt and see the roots and see how it sort of moved around the rocks to get where they go and how deep the roots go and how dirty it is. Because that's sort of what being an entrepreneur really is. People see, oh, wow, he's got this great life, but they don't see, you know, the backside of what's going on. And, you know... The, the, the thing that sort of excites me and, and scares you at the same time is that, the, is that you don't know what's coming around the corner and there are struggles every day. Look, entrepreneurship and solopreneurship is not for everybody, right? It, it is a very difficult, scary, intimidating thing because you now are sort of the, the captain of your ship. Maybe you're the only person on the ship, right? So you are the content producer, the marketing, the sales guy. You got to make sure that cash flow is coming in and that your kids are eating ramen noodles at least two or three times a week. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot of points along the way that you start to question yourself. Oh, is this a good idea? Should I really do this? Can I take this leap of faith? Do I have a big enough parachute that I can quit my job? Do I have enough money in the bank? Do, you know, what happens if I fail? And I think we as entrepreneurs go through that all the time. Uh, I don't think you get to a certain point where like, ah, oh, I could just sit back and relax and, and enjoy all the successes. Um, I think the key, man, really boils down to two words for me. And it's a, it's a philosophy I uh, follow in my business and clearly in my personal life. And it's two words, stay hungry, right? You've always got to be looking to do what's next. You always got, you can't be satisfied when you reach a goal. You got to start doing what's next. And obviously I love to eat too. So it has a, a nice double meaning for me. Yeah. And I worked at <laughs> Apple. So Steve Jobs thing was always stay hungry, stay foolish. And I absolutely agree with it. I think that you always need to be striving for more. And this was something that I think a good friend of mine actually pointed out to me. She was like, you are always staying on the cutting edge of whatever is coming out marketing wise. And that's why I like to hang out with you. And she was like, (laughs) I want to know what's next. Do I need to start a podcast? Do I need to do this? So it's a very uh, resourceful tool to be staying hungry all the time and be looking at, you know, where you can go next. And uh, I always tell people about this analogy of, you know, I'm a rower and we row out in these boats three times a week. I'm actually leaving tomorrow for four days on a private lake with a coach. I'm super excited for it. We'll be rowing three times a day. And when you're in the boats, you're actually going this way. So you can only see where you've been. You can, you can see a little trail through the water of you know, where you've come from, but you can't see where you're going. You, know, you, you can turn around for a quick second to kind of make sure there's no big bridge or anything in your way, but you can't really tell you know, five miles out what's going to be out there. And I think that's the best way to look at life is you know, turn around every once in a while and try to make sure there's no bridge or anything in your way. But other than that, you know, just accept where you've come from and be present and where you are in the moment in the boat, so to speak. I love that, man. I love that analogy. I I think that's awesome because for me, and I say this all the time, the things that excite me most is what's coming. Like the things that I don't know are ahead. And I think that is very scary for people, right? Having your back to the future. They don't like looking in the past. They want to see what the, but people say, well, what's your goal? Like what? And I'm like, I don't have a goal, right? I, I, the goal is always a sort of a, a, a moving target. So uh, yeah, as long as there's no waterfalls behind you, you'll yeah. be all right. <laughs> and uh, just to add to that, another quick thing, you know, uh, there was this great TED talk from uh, this guy who's talking about how we think, oh, well, if I just make this amount of money, I'll be happy. Or if I just do this one thing, I'll be happy. And the problem is we hit where we set that bar and then the bar moves here. Mm-hmm. And you never get to that bar because you expect that happiness comes from achieving these certain things when really happiness is something that comes from inside. So uh, just to ask you, you know, what are some things that you like doing to, to keep yourself happy? You've got tons of obstacles as an entrepreneur. You've got a family and people to take care of. Uh, so how do you kind of even out and balance life with, you know, work and play? Uh, I'm a family first kind of guy, man. Like the, the things that excite me the most is, you know, I've got a nine year old and 11 year old. Well, she's 11 going on 35, but my nine and 11 year old, you know, and my family, um, is the most important thing. And when I'm able to do something that makes them happy or makes them proud, 
Like that's, you know, the most rewarding thing in the world. And I, and I know that that is such a, a cliched answer, but it's true. But I wouldn't be here, man, without them. I wouldn't be here without that support system, which is another thing as an entrepreneur, I think is hopefully that you have because it's so vital to have a support system around you that encourages you. Like my wife bought into the dream. Like if you tell most women, like, listen, you're going to marry a lawyer in New Jersey. And then a couple years later, it's going to be like, listen, we're going to sell it all and move to Disney World. They'd be like, what are you nuts? Like, what, what? you know, my wife never said, oh, you can't do this or I'm not going to like that just doesn't it's not in our vocabulary. And uh, and I'm forever grateful for that. That, that's awesome. So uh, there's some great lessons here just on entrepreneurship alone, but I have to start asking you about Disney because <laughs> as a kid growing up, uh, I was one of those kids who like was like, forget cartoons. Like I wanted to watch, you know, TLC and those crazy like <laughs> surgeries and doctors and all sorts of craziness. So I used to watch Travel Channel and they had these awesome things about like the hidden gems of Disney World. Like there's hidden Mickey Mouses in the in the ground and in the architecture and all these sorts of cool secrets. So what is your favorite like hidden gem of Disney? Oh man, that's uh, that's tough because that's one of the things that, that I love doing, man, is letting people know that there's so much beyond the surface, right? You know, where, where you get to the parks and you look at your map and you're running from this attraction to this attraction. I'm like, no, no, slow down because there's so many overlooked experiences and learning experiences and stories woven in and details and tributes throughout the parks. And that's how, that's really part of the reason why I started, that's how I wrote my first book, right? I both wrote the book I wanted to read. I wrote a book about the trivia and the minutia and the details because I want to enhance people's um, understanding and, and appreciation and enjoyment of the parks. And I think as you start to peel back those layers of the onion, you're like, oh, I see what the Imagineers did here. Uh, I'm a Magic Kingdom guy, man. I'm a nostalgic um, and I will tell you, and this is maybe a, a bad reflection on my uh, education growing up, but I learned more about American history and my understanding and appreciation of what it was like in this 3D environment, walking through Liberty Square and Frontierland in Magic Kingdom than I remembered from me being in school. And I love being able to take families or kids now and then point those things out and watch them sort of connect the dots. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is really, Liberty Square and Frontierland really chronicles the, the journey of the American people from the colonization in the Northeast to the gold rush in the West and how they met. And it's fascinating. Um, it's fascinating that the detail the Imagineers put in. Yeah. So do you think that, you know, when, when Walt originally set off to do this and to make these theme parks, I, I guess he couldn't foresee that the huge impact that he was going to have on the entire world, you know, 40, 50 years down the road. Uh, it, which kind of goes back to our rowing analogy is you can't really look at what's down the road. But um, I guess, what do you think they originally set off to do? Because I don't think it was just about, you know, here's some rides that a bunch of kids get to go on and have fun. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And, you know, you want there's, there's so many lessons we can learn as entrepreneurs from Walt Disney. Like he was the, the consummate 20th century entrepreneur because he was – taking risks and he was always innovating and people were telling him that his ideas were stupid. Like, well, nobody's going to sit through a two hour cartoon when he was making Snow White. They called it Disney's folly. It changed movie making right for the future. When he was building Disneyland, I was like, Walt, what are you talking about? Like amusement parks are dirty and dangerous and disgusting. He's like, exactly. I'm going to do something completely different. When they came to Florida, the idea wasn't to build a copy of Disneyland. The idea was to build this experimental prototype community of tomorrow, a real working city, which was the original idea for what Epcot Center was. Um, he unfortunately passed away before they could uh, execute on his vision because they weren't sure how to put all of his ideas into place. But, you know, that's what he was, right? He was always innovating. He was always trying to do what's next. And I think um, a, a lot of the people in the company still sort of follow that same mission from Walt, and that's why they are continuing to do some of the cool things they do. So along the same lines of, you know, him finishing off his mission and, and what he set out to do, and maybe this is getting pretty deep here, I don't know, but how do you think we, uh, you know, where we are right now can ensure that we see our mission all the way through? You know, he lived a great and long life, but I think I would be so afraid that I would get to the end of my life and I didn't get to do all the things that I wanted to do. How do we make sure that we do that now? 
Well, it's interesting, right? Because we're as entrepreneurs, sometimes we, we think about our legacy, right? Especially when I, you know, when I start having kids, you also you start to think about like, what happens when I'm gone? What is my legacy going to be? But to a point that your friend made before, she saw you and what you were interested in. She's like, I need to, I need to be with you. I need to associate myself with you. And I think that's an important lesson for entrepreneurs too, is the importance of team. You don't see a lot of successful hermits, right? <laughs> you, you have to have people around you that are like-minded, that understand the journey. And that's what Walt did. Walt admittedly was not a great artist. He was not a great animator, but he surrounded himself by the people who were the very best at what they did. I think Bob Iger, who's the current CEO of Disney, has done the same thing on a different scale where he has acquired the companies that are the best at what they do. Muppets, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars. Like, dude, he literally, like, Disney purchased my entire childhood and wrapped <laughs> it up in a bow for me. Like, it, it couldn't get any better, but they are the giants in family entertainment, right? So the way to ensure that your vision continues on is to have people around you that can carry that out if you can't, when you can't, or alongside you, right? So you can do the things that you are uniquely qualified to do and have other people around you do some of the other tasks for and with you. And this is something that I think I probably made a mistake just when I first got into business is I was like, well, I'm going to be the website designer, the graphic designer, the videographer, the editor, the photographer, you know, the cook and the maid. <laughs> like. <laughs> I'm doing everything, and I think this is probably a lesson that you've probably run into as well. Um, you know, we've got to delegate things out and learn when uh, it's not something for us to do. And this was kind of a Tim Ferriss four-hour work week type thing, but you know, understanding that if you are the videographer, you need to pay somebody else to make your website. You know, and and uh, we're actually even talking about it now. I have three roommates. And we're at a point where we're so busy in our businesses and, and in our jobs that uh, we're looking into getting somebody to cut our lawn or clean the house. And it's stuff that, you know, you have to accept that, A, you're not good at, but B, <laughs> you either don't want to do or don't have time to do it because you're trying to do things that are more important for your advancement. So I think understanding, you know, where you are and what your strengths are and, and just playing off of that, knowing when to give the rest out. Right. And realizing that it, you you can't and you shouldn't do everything yourself, I, I think, is is key because we all want to sort of it's our baby. Right. We, we feel like we have to touch everything. We've got to do everything. And you're right. Realize, too, that if you're like, oh, I need to make graphics and let me figure out how to use Photoshop. Dude, there's somebody else like that's what they do. They've got the eye. They've got the experience. You're better off just saying, hey, can you help me with this once I understand the vision? And then, like you said, all those different pieces of the puzzle will, will come together with, with help. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's kind of how Disney was built. You know, it, it took probably hundreds, if not thousands of people to make it happen. Um, and um, I, I guess the thing I wanted to ask you was more of, uh, we've noticed that Disney is not just from our childhood, right? Like Disney from your childhood is way different from my childhood, but it's always stayed modern somehow, e even though it's it's cartoons and it's you know it it's so interesting to me to see how uh, they've kind of stuck with the times and they've always changed with it as it goes. Uh, could you maybe speak as to how they've done that or how they've kind of stayed with each generation as a new generation comes out? Well, I think it's interesting because uh, you know the the company like Walt is always it's very very technology driven, right? Walt used to sort of be frustrated by the limitations of his tech of the technology, so he had his Imagineers invent it for him, and I think that's what Disney does too, right? They're able to continue to appeal to new generations because they're able to you're, they're they're able to reach them in a lot of different ways. But I think the reason why everybody loves Disney, or we all have is because you all have an emotional connection to it, right? Disney knows how to tap into your emotions, whatever it might be, whether it's music, whether it's a, a movie, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a video game, whatever it is. And that's why the brand has such incredible brand. I, I can't even think of any other company that comes remotely close, maybe Apple, but in a different way, that has the same type of brand loyalty that Disney does. Look, you've got dorks out there podcasting for 10 years about Walt Disney World because we love it, right? You don't see that. There's no, you know, for, for lack of a better example, there's no Six Flags podcast, right? Nobody's podcasting about Six Flags for 10 years because they don't have that same type of an emotional connection. 
And that's how Disney is able to continue to reach new audiences. Look, Frozen, whether you love it or hate it or you can't stand let it go one more time, that is this generation's Lion King. It was another generation's, you know, Mary Poppins, whatever it is. They've reached these kids, these young kids and kids at heart because of the emotion, because of the music, all the things that made Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin popular, you know, one generation ago. It, it's funny that you bring that up because when I was, um, when Frozen first came out, I was just like, I'm so done with this. Like the second that this goes away, I will be a happy camper. But I was traveling with a friend when I took some time off from my business in, uh, in November and we're in San Francisco one night and we just, we didn't want to go out. We didn't want to do anything. She was like, let's watch Frozen. In the back of my head, I'm just like, this can't be happening. Like, I'm not going to do this. And uh, I did anyway. I'm like, you know what? It, it's Disney. Like, I've always loved Disney stuff. And it uh, wasn't bad, you know? And I think it's because, like you said, there's that emotional connection. And it brought back, you know, the same sort of things of, of childhood and what it was like to be a kid watching these movies. And I think that at the end of the day, everybody wants to be a kid again. You know, it's the one thing that you can't do or go back to. But, you know, in your mind, you can always stay young. So I think that... Disney does a great job at, you know, trying to keep the world young. Yeah, and, and you're right. It, it's Disney is an escape, right? The reason why tens of millions of people go to Disney World every year is because when you walk through the gates of, of Magic Kingdom or, or Disneyland, it's a, and I hate to, you know, sound so fluffy about it, but it's a transformative experience, right? Something happens to you. There's something special about that place, and all of a sudden, you forget about everything else going on in the real world, right? And it does allow me to be a kid again. And I think that's part of the reason why that place and that destination attracts so many people, makes so many people like me move here, right? Because you want to be close to it. You want to have that feeling as often as you can. Yeah. So uh, to round things out here, you know, what, what do you think we could do to almost create that escape in our own lives? I mean, obviously, we can't all go fly away to Neverland, you know, with Peter Pan every single day because there's this thing called bills and food that we've got to put on the table. But, you know, is there a way that we can create a business or a lifestyle that allows us to live that escape every once in a while when we need it? So I think that's what entrepreneurship does for you. If you do it right and it works out for you, I think that's entrepreneurship does for you. Because, look, man, part of the reason, like you, that I am where I am now is because – and I see that and I feel bad for people that get up and are like, oh, I hate my freaking job. I hate my boss. But I can't wait to go home and work on X, right? And their eyes light up and they can't wait for – nights and weekends. I'm like, man, you need to have a job where you don't care about Mondays, man, because you're doing something that you love. So my job for me is an escape. Like I wake up every day excited and pumped and I dig Mondays because nobody else is working on Sundays. And I'm like, I need to get somebody on the phone and like, I need to get this email answered. So I think, and, and I know that this sounds, you know, very sort of, um, dreamery ish, but look, it's 2015, man. Like we've got the tools and opportunity to create a life that you love, right? You don't have to wait for somebody to give you a chance, to give you a TV show, to give you a radio show, to publish your book for you. You could do all those things by yourself today. Like there's no excuse why you can't. You like Alf, go start a blog about Alf. You like, you know, bamboo trees or, you know, doing a Mr. Miyagi thing, do a video series about it with your iPhone and start a YouTube channel. You can podcast with your iPhone or a microphone right now for like free or maybe 10 bucks maximum. You can have a voice and there is a way, and, I, and I'm a firm believer, if you do what you love and you hustle at it and you work and you don't quit and don't get down on yourself, the money will eventually come. Yeah. And that's something that I've had to live. You know, I, I quit a job at Apple making only $30,000 a year. And I'm thinking, all right, you know, I've got rent, I've got food, I've got all these new expenses because along with the business comes lovely thing called <laughs> higher taxes uh, and, and more things than that. But it, I just think that um, we look at the obstacles and just get trapped. We get this paralysis and so it ultimately comes down to what I would say, or at least in speaking to you, I would think is we have to become our own imagineer. We have to imagine the place that we want to be in and then figure out how to make it happen because that's exactly what Walt did was he got all these imagineers together and said, here's what I want to do. I know the technology isn't out to do it right now, so how do we make this happen with what we have right now? Yeah, and I think the other important element too 
going back to what you said before and, and the tree analogy is if you really want it, like if you really want it bad enough and you want it and you're saying, all right, I'm willing to take that risk, be also be also be willing to make the sacrifices because yeah. there's a lot of sacrifices along the way. You know, your friends are out, they're drinking or hanging out, whatever, and you're like, no, man, I need to stay home and work on a video. I need to stay home and work on this. I- I've made sacrifices that a lot of people don't see because it's not monetary sacrifices, but it's time with your family, right? It's opportunities. But the goal for me, or the goals, plural, is worth the sacrifices along the way. Absolutely. And I think that every sacrifice I've made has been worth it up until this point. So I'm excited to see where things go. Lou, it's been awesome to talk to you. I can't wait to kind of pick your brain a little bit more about Disney and just kind of hang out <laughs> when we get to the podcast conference in July. But yeah, thanks man, for you know, spending some time with me. If you could share, I know you've got WDWradio.com and a couple other sites. If you want to share those with everybody to check out what you have, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, everything, all the Disney stuff I do can be found at www.radio.com. And my personal website um, and sort of the business side of what I do is over at loumangelo.com. And I, I'm at loumangelo on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else. Awesome. And we'll be sure to post those links on our website at www.yearofpurpose.com. Lou, it's been awesome talking to you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. You've probably heard me talk about designing a life that you actually want to live. You might have even heard about my travels or experiences and thought to yourself, yeah, I do want to do that. Eventually, someday I'll probably do it. And my guess is that you've been thinking about doing it for a long time. So I want to tell you this, stop thinking. Your time is right now. You don't need any more time. You don't need any more info. You don't need to keep putting it off and planning for the perfect time because the truth of the matter is this. You could be the person who sits around and thinks about living a better life, or you can be the person that decides that today is the day that you're going to actually do it and I want that for you. Because you already have what it takes. You've got a fire inside, even if you can't see it right now. It's lit, but you need to open yourself up to the possibilities and throw a couple logs into the flames. So join me and the Euro Purpose tribe by subscribing to our YouTube channel and iTunes podcast. And if you really like us, please leave a review. This is Effin Moses Blacksburg, and I can't wait to see you again on the Year of Purpose podcast.